Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey folks, are you looking for another revenue source for your operation, but get stressed out at the thought of taking on another task or business? If this is true, I'd encourage you to look at partnering with Land Trust. Land Trust is a business that connects landowners with recreationalists that want to hunt, fish, hike, camp, stargaze, take egg tours, or anything else you can dream of. They take care of the listing, promoting, and work you, quite frankly, don't have time for, but you still get to enjoy the extra revenue. The best part about this program, if you are a landowner, is that you still maintain 100% control of your land, who is on it, and when they are on it. Learn more by going to landtrust.com slash cattle convos. That link is in the show notes. Alrighty, folks. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. It's Shay here, and today we will be visiting with Aaron Berger about reducing feed waste. And I know some of you who might be in more southern parts of the country, you have the ability to graze more months out of the year than those of us up north. But regardless, anytime you have to feed hay or a totally mixed ration to those cows or any feed resource, we want to make sure that we are maximizing that because we do know that feed costs can be one of the biggest input costs for cow-calf producers. And so Aaron's going to provide tips to help us be more efficient on that front. Now, before we dive into the episode, I do want to let you know that if you are looking for more free resources about cattle management, you can sign up for my free weekly newsletter. Go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com, and hit subscribe to Ranching Resources. And from there, you can get information sent to your inbox every week. With that, let's visit with Aaron. Well, Aaron, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. I know I enjoy listening to Beef Watch and hearing what you get to share there. So I'm excited to have you on this podcast as well. And we are going to be talking about reducing feed waste and just being more efficient with our resources because we all know that input costs are high. And even with good cattle prices, we still need to be looking at reducing input costs wherever we can. So Before we dive into that, would you share with the listeners today a little bit about who you are and what you're doing in the beef industry? Sure. So I'm Aaron Berger. I work for the University of Nebraska-Lincoln as an extension educator. I'm based in the South Panhandle. My office is at Kimball, but I really serve all of the state and I would say surrounding states as well. Uh, You mentioned the Beef Watch podcast and uh, a lot of people listen to that, uh, not only in Nebraska, but all over the United States and around the world. So I'll get questions uh, from people from a lot of different places, other countries sometimes uh, based on podcast information. So uh, the time we live in really information and the access to it is one of the, I think the really cool things about the time we live in because of just the availability of information. Uh, a little background on me, I grew up on a seed stock operation. Uh, my parents raised hybrid bulls or composite bulls, however you want to view that. Um, went to the University of Nebraska, got an undergrad degree from there. Uh, while I was there, I did some time in a feed yard in Texas and I wasn't saying that like a prison, it was a good experience, but uh, <laughs> uh, spent some time in Texas in a feed yard, worked on a major corporate ranch in Nebraska for a while, uh, went to Colorado State where I got a master's degree in beef cattle management systems. And so kind of a unique master's where I got to design my own program. But basically for your listeners, if they've ever heard of case studies, Harvard Business School type case studies, I basically wrote three of those based on three actual ranches where we looked at the ranch and looked at issues they were facing put it together in a case study, and then they use that as a teaching tool uh, with upper level classes there. And also the King Ranch Institute uh, uses that as some of their master's program there. Uh, From there, I went and managed uh, the Laster Ranch, which is a foundation of the Beef Master Breed in Colorado. Also, they had an all-natural grass-fed beef business. And so uh, we were marketing beef uh, mail order through shipping and also uh, through health food stores and directly to consumers. So I really have had a wide experience of experiences with that. I was there three years and then came to Nebraska. So I've been with Nebraska Extension for, I guess, a little over 19 years. Uh, Part of my time here also, uh, my wife and I leased a ranch for a while. We had about 150 cows, uh, irrigated some irrigated grass, leased corn stalks, uh, leased pasture from a number of people, leased cows. So um, can identify with that piece. And then due to some family health issues, I've just been with Extension now for the last uh, 10 years. So as I guess not having a, another side ranching enterprise. So that's kind of my background, a little bit of what I do. And 
Uh, right now, my focus is primarily on working with ranchers on forage and range related questions, cow calf economics, um, looking at some marketing risk management things. Um, I guess I feel like I'm fortunate having a broad background that I think I can approach things utilizing a systems approach, understanding parts of the pieces that come together. And so that's what I do now in my current role. You do have a wide variety of experiences. And I, I always enjoy it when I'm interviewing people who do have those wide variety of experiences because they can look at things with that big picture systems approach. So as we dive into this conversation, I mean, right off the bat, when we're talking about feed waste and feeding cattle, what are the economic implications of having excess feed waste or just not being efficient with our feed resources in general? Yeah, this is one thing that really gets your attention quickly. Just sit down some time and think about the price of hay. So right now, Nebraska, for any type of decent hay, we're looking at 180 a ton here in Western Nebraska. So, you know, if I'm wasting 20 to 30% of that, think about $180 a ton hay. If from the time I purchase it till I actually get it into the belly of the cow, if I lose 30%, that $180 ton hay basically became $240 ton hay actually into the belly of the cow. That is a huge deal. And so feed waste is big, whether it's not just the feed that's wasted when we go out and deliver it to the cow, but depending on where you're at listening to this podcast, you know, parts of the country really deal with a lot of hay deterioration from the time they put it up, just in, you know, what happens naturally with rainfall and things like that. Or if we're thinking about things like corn silage, we're at a time of year where people are harvesting that, you know, minimal good management corn silage is you're going to lose 15% of dry matter in a very well managed corn silage pile. Uh, if it's not managed well, we can get up in that 30, 40% area. So it's a significant thing and being under, able to understand where and why waste is occurring uh, is really important as you think about your harvested feed expense. So before we dive into strategies for reducing feed waste, since you talked about how you like to look at things from a whole systems approach, how can producers start analyzing their current system and see where some of those problems may lie? Yeah, that's a great question. So I really am a believer in thinking about your operation from an economic perspective. If you're thinking about considering making change. So what I mean by that is uh, sometimes we talk about things and we say, you know, how do I value my costs? And, you know, if you're not going to make any changes, then I just encourage you to track cost all the way through your system. So if I'm putting a pay, it costs me X amount to put a pay. That's what it costs to feed my cow, and, you know, from a hay standpoint. On the other hand, if you said, OK, what if I looked at the economic value of that hay? So let's say I'll just pick a number. It costs you $100 a ton to put up hay and it has a sale or market value of $200 a ton. Well, you only spent $100 a ton, but does that hay have value that's greater than what it cost you to put it up? Yes, it does. It's worth $200 a ton. So if you're trying to think about how can I improve profitability on the operation, you might say, well, it only cost me $100 a ton to put up the hay. That's what I'm going to charge the cows. And, and that's fine. But if I'm thinking about where do I capture more value in my operation, if I'm only charging my cows $100 and the market value is $200, am I in effect subsidizing my cows with hay that I'm not getting its full market value for. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I really encourage people to think about that. If I'm thinking about wanting to make my operation more profitable, then I need to look at the different pieces and say, what's the market value of the commodity or thing I produce? And I need to think about, am I capturing or am I recognizing the value of that throughout my operation? Same thing with grass. If I'm growing grass, it has a market value. I could lease that grass to somebody else. Now, if I own the land, I might say, well, I have to pay the taxes, which I do. And I have to, you know, maintenance and upkeep on fences, water development, feed control or weed control. But if I say, I don't, if I own land, I don't have to own cows. So what's the market value of the grass I produce? If my cows were asked to pay market value, could they do that and still be adding value to that and make a profit? If they can't, and I'm really thinking about trying to be profitable, then I have to ask, how can I change my system? So that's a long answer to your question. But I really think if I'm thinking about making changes, I need to look at the economic value of the things I own, produce, and am I capturing that? So with that, are you thinking producers are miscalculating their break even sometime by not factoring that in? So I think there's two ways to look at this again, from a 
from a strictly cash cost. What does it cost me? What am I, you know, what do I have to write a check for? I think sometimes people don't know that number and they're coming up with a, you know, it, it only costs me, let's say it costs me a hundred dollars a ton to put up the hay. So that's what I'm gonna charge myself. And again, I think that's fine if you're just saying it costs what it costs. If I want to be more profitable, then I need to ask, am I capturing all the potential value? And if I'm if I'm providing hay that costs me a hundred dollars a ton to my cows, because that's what it costs for me to put it up, but it has a market value of two hundred dollars a ton. Maybe economically, it'd be better for me to not own cows and sell hay. Now, already I can see some listeners being like, I'm not going to do that. And I, and I get, get that, right? But I then should ask the question, well, what if I wasn't putting up hay and I had to buy hay? Could I make my cow enterprise work? So you just want to be fair with yourself because really, I think sometimes we forget as farmers and ranchers, we're really asset managers. We're business managers. Another business that they're looking at their assets, they're trying to figure out how to capture value. You know, how do I get more value? How do I get more of what we produce to have value in the marketplace and then get more of that value? And I think for a lot of farmers and ranchers, they need to do that. Now to circle back. So if I'm looking at my annual cow cost or my cost of production from an economic perspective, then I say you need to value your hay at market value. You need to value your labor at market value. So if you're going to go, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't pay myself. Well, that's a problem. You should pay yourself. You should pay yourself what you're worth. Because if you're not, you're actually subsidizing your cow herd with your free labor. You wouldn't go work for someone else for free. Same thing with your money. Uh, would you make your Would you make someone an interest free loan? I'll ask people that. Hey, would you loan me one hundred thousand dollars for the next year? But oh, one caveat: I'm not going to pay you any interest, but I'll give you your money back. Nobody's going to do that, right? But we do that to ourselves all the time in our business dealings. And so I think we need to be real with ourselves about our costs. And then, from an economic perspective, if I value my labor, I value my money. I value my equipment and my, you know, what does my actual economic cost look like? So we're really kind of talking about two different things. I, and we want to be fair mm -hmm. with ourselves about that, but also recognize the difference. Um, and you'll see some numbers published. I'll pick on cattle facts. And uh, sometimes if self people self-report their numbers, they're reporting things they often write a check for. They're not reporting their economic value, if that makes sense, because they may not charge themselves labor. They're not looking at depreciation, not looking at any return on their investment in terms of capital. So those things you have to be careful about as you think about your, your farm or ranch operation. That does make sense. And I appreciate you circling through all of that. Now, do you have off the top of your head an updated average break-even cost for say your traditional commercial cow-calf producer? For we'll yeah. say Nebraska, because I know it's yeah. going to vary region to region. So let's just say Nebraska for now. What is that updated number? Yeah, right now I put the numbers to it and I use current cow calf, you know, feed cost, uh, opportunity interest on the capital investment, the cow replacement cost. We're going to be pushing twelve fifty uh, per cow right now. Uh, and I shouldn't say per cow; that'd be per calf produced. So if I'm thinking about a eighty eight percent calf crop wean per cow exposed. Uh, you know, we're probably looking around $1,250, $1,300 right now for a weaned calf. With, you know, $1,500, $1,600 calves, we're going to be profitable this year. Now, there's some people that you know, we look at that number and Shay, as we were talking before we got on, you guys had nine months of winter. A lot of people fed a lot more harvested feed this year than they normally do. And so for a lot of folks, I'm using kind of a long-term average with those numbers. Mm -hmm. Their costs this year actually are much higher because they were scrambling to find feed and buying whatever feed they could at a higher price this year. So my 1250 number, you know, with additional harvest of winter feed costs, that may be closer to 1350, 1400 for some folks because of the winter this year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was, even if you had, well, you thought you had extra feed. I know we did until May got there and we still didn't have grass. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. 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 So I guess bottom line is it was an expensive year. If you just look at a production year from, no, let's say, November till this coming October, the amount of harvested feed fed and the value of that, uh, it was a big year in terms of cost for cap calf producers. Absolutely. Hey, folks, if you are enjoying this podcast and want to make sure that you never miss another episode, be sure to head to my website and click the subscribe to Ranching Resources tab. From here, you can sign up for my weekly newsletter and you will have new episodes and articles and industry news sent straight to your inbox every Wednesday. So you can go to my show notes and there will be a link there for you to sign up. So now that we've talked 
about the systems. Unless, is there anything else you want to talk about on the system side before we dive into tactics? Yeah. So I guess I would just circle back and say, as you think about this conversation or topic of harvested feed cost, I think you want to ask the question, does the system I have in place still fit with the cost today? And, uh, you know, I just go back, we look at how things have changed over the last 40, 50 years, fuel, fertilizer, equipment, labor, you know, those are major things in harvested feed. So it's not just the cost of the feed itself, but it's the cost of getting the feed to the cattle, delivering it. Uh, those are all major expenses. And, you know, we look at the inflation and what's happened with labor and equipment. Uh, just go price a 120 horsepower tractor today compared to what it was 30, 40 years ago. And so sometimes we have a system in place where maybe we have the equipment and we're doing what we have been doing. But if we look at, okay, now I need to go replace that equipment, all of a sudden our cost structure really is going to look different because to update ourselves to be in the same management system in terms of our feeding plan looks a lot more expensive going forward than maybe it has historically. So I think what I would just ask is, you know, does your current system still fit the economic uh, environment that we're in today compared to maybe what it was 30, 40 years ago. Sometimes things have changed drastically. Maybe we need to rethink what we're doing and why uh, could we be doing something different? So I think that does tail us into then thinking about the feed waste question. Um, you know, does my current system in terms of what I'm feeding, is that really my the best for the resources available to us? If I think it is, then, then we can talk about, okay, how do we manage that well? Yeah. So Let's dive into the feed waste side of it and some different strategies for reducing that. So I kind of want to talk about at least two different sides of it, because there are some producers who are taking bales out every day, or maybe they're already bale grazing or doing stuff like that, but they're, they're feeding bales. And then there are producers who are feeding that totally mixed ration too, which are two different types of feeding. So let's start with those producers who are focused more on just taking out those grass bales with alfalfa or whatever, but just the bale grazing side of it. So how can they reduce some of their feed waste as they're feeding those bales? Yeah. So I think one thing for me that sometimes you can look at uh, extension publications is actually thinking about, okay, how much waste actually happens from the time the feed was cut. I'm thinking about harvesting, if you're harvesting it yourself to actually get it in the bale and then storage loss, whether that's storing it outside or however you're storing it, you know, dry matter loss, and then the process from getting it to that point to actually getting it into the belly of the cow. So there's a lot of different steps along the way where we could have waste occur. Most of us think about the waste that happens when we enroll the bale, put it through a bale processor, you know, how much of what was in that bale when it was on the processor actually gets into the belly of the cow, or if we enrolled it, how much did we waste? So I think there's some different things to think about with that. I think also sometimes we have to recognize waste may have value. And what I'm thinking about here, Shay, is thinking about bale grazing, right? So we put bales out on a, a smooth brome or you know a, a wet meadow where we've got perennial cool season grass that can effectively utilize those nutrients. We may have higher amounts of waste, but that waste may have value because we can capture those nutrients effectively to grow more grass. So just our conversation about waste, I want to be careful too, because sometimes waste can have value. And, and, you know, even the concept around bale grazing. So if I'm bale grazing and I'm having waste in an area where we can capture those nutrients and grow more grass, uh, it may not be that big a deal, or it actually may be not that costly. But if I'm, you know, feeding out on a pasture where I'm not really capturing the nutrients very effectively, or if, especially if I'm feeding in a dry lot and I'm not capturing those nutrients very effectively, then that waste becomes much more expensive. So again, that's part of that systems question. Um, so just thinking about waste, I think, you know, let's talk about hay. Quality of hay obviously makes a difference in waste. So if I sometimes see this, uh, people will bring me a hay sample and I'll pick on sorghum sedan because we have a fair amount of that here. Sometimes you can get really big stems on that and, you know, it's less expensive to buy. But if you actually look at how much gets into the belly of the cow, you'll go out, you'll see a lot of uh, waste on the ground. So you need to recognize, you know, what's happening with that. They're not consuming it. Uh, you know, some people are thinking about uh, unrolling bales. You know, I think you want, if you're going to be feeding hay daily, uh, am I feeding the amount that's needed to meet the animal's needs? And is it adequate in terms of what I'm delivering? And then how much are they not getting in there? You know, how much are they not consuming? So, you know, lower quality hay, sometimes they'll waste more. 
Uh, that can actually be more expensive than the higher quality hay because they're not eating all of it. So those are some things they're you know thinking about feed waste. Uh, from a hay delivery standpoint, some people, a lot of cow calf producers, this is a secondary enterprise, and I get that because uh, I've got that experience personally. And so sometimes people might be feeding hay from the hay that the cows need, and it's supposed to last two or three or four days. Well, if you're unrolling a bale or putting it through a processor, um, there's going to be more waste uh, just because cows are going to lay on it, you know, defecate on it, things like that. So there's different ways to do that as far as taking bales out. Uh, we could transition and then talk about, you know, feeding in a bale ring or things like that in a dry lot. Uh, some really good data out of Oklahoma. If your listeners want to go look at that, some studies done there looking at feeding bales and bale rings. Uh, bottom line, a bale ring with a skirt on the bottom or what they call a cradle type feeder is going to be the least waste. Uh, some of those open ring feeders, um, their data would say have more waste. Uh, the other thing I've worked with some producers on is actually limiting access to the hay. So some good data out of Illinois and out of Minnesota, where maybe you actually restrict access to hay and bale feeders for as little as three to six hours. You know, if you think about cows, they'll they'll eat what they need, and then maybe they're if they're standing around. What are they likely to do? Well, they're going to probably lay down and chew their cud, or they'll go to the hay feeder. They'll pull out a mouthful. They'll kind of walk around, and we've all seen that around bale feeders where you got this you know, a lot of feed on the ground, they're stepping on it. So, you know, combination of the type of bale feeder you use, and then also could you limit access can be tools to reduce waste in a feeding situation where you're feeding round bales in a feeder. Is there anything else you want to touch on from the dry lot perspective for those feeding with hay rings? Yeah. So I think if you're feeding with hay rings in a dry lot, um, also just recognize that um, you know, can I, what's the type of feeder that I'm using? Second, could I limit access to those feeders and have that uh, help me? And some people might be like, oh, that sounds like a lot of work. Well, there's some things now with like time release ga gate latches, things like that. And, you know, there's some people who uh, put cows onto hay at night, especially if you're uh, calving to, because there's some data that would say that if you put cows on feed at night, they're more likely to calve in the daytime. So we, there's some people who do that, but just think about your strategy with that. Is there a way you could set up a system that you could reduce waste with the type of hay, hay feeder you use or with limiting access? Now, the other thing is um, for some of the people I work with, uh, we're using a combination of bale rings, but then also providing some supplement in a bunk where we might have the bunks in a separate pen. And so the bunks are actually the attractant to pull the cattle away from the hay feeder and then lock them up there for the rest of the day. Till we go back to feed. So maybe I'm feeding a little grain to complement the hay I have, or I'm feeding some distiller's grains or, you know, something else as a protein supplement. And then also including something like an ionophore like rumensin that improves feed efficiency. That's another way to reduce hay use, hay waste. Awesome. Well, thank you for diving into that side of feeding cattle in the winter when we can't be grazing. So what about those folks who are feeding those TMRs? What can they do to look at reducing some of their waste? Yeah. So I think if you're in a TMR, you're thinking about waste, you know, are you feeding in a bunk? What's the amount of bunk space you have? Uh, thinking about, you know, what's there. We're thinking about maybe the length of the grind. If we're grinding hay, you know, if you're using something like uh, corn stalks, in, at least in Nebraska now, we're seeing that used quite a bit. So just how's that being ground? How's that being mixed? Uh I'm really a fan, if you can, of having a wet component to your TMR, your ration, whether that's corn silage or wet distillers or, um, you know, even honestly, I've worked with some people where it's just putting a garden hose in there for a while to get some wetness to kind of tack that together, um, you know, to help it not, cattle can't sort it as much. So you got maybe less left in the bunk. So those would be some thoughts there on a TMR perspective, you know, from a cow-calf <clears throat> cow -calf ration standpoint. Uh, some people are using things like a chuck wagon, you know, where they maybe aren't don't have a vertical mixture and they basically got beaters on a, a floor driven uh, chain. You know, just thinking about even your mix, how can you uh, put some things together so that uh, maybe cattle don't sort that as much and uh, you get good consumption. And is that, um, I'm assuming, like you mentioned with the hay, like having like a bottom to those bunks helps. That's the same thing with the TMR to reduce waste. Yeah. So I think, you know, having a bottom to the bunk, um, you have to be careful though, as you think about things, what does it cost me for the facility versus what is my cost of waste? 
And sometimes there's scenarios where uh, I see people feed under electric fence wire as their feed bunk, so to speak, because it allows them to move the cattle around. It allows them to spread the manure out. And, and sometimes, we, again, this is part of that system question, I think, Shay, you know, maybe it'd be better for me to feed a TMR out on the ground where then the manure and manure urine from those cows is being captured in an environment where it, the forage can grow versus in a dry lot scenario where I then have to, I don't capture it very much because the the urine volatilizes off the nitrogen that's there. We lose, uh, you know, we don't capture as much of the nutrients as if it was out on ground where we had a crop that would be growing. So that's, again, that's part of that system question. Um, and I want to be circle back and be careful about thinking about waste uh, because waste in the right situation may have value. I know that makes sense. That's a little different way of thinking mm -hmm. about it. But uh, yeah, if I'm in a dry lot, I, I don't want to have any waste because that's expensive. If I'm out on a ground where we can capture and use nutrients, then that waste may actually have value. So, you know, you mentioned opportunity costs of the facility versus the waste, you know, what's going to cost you more there? What about the amount of labor and time people are putting into their feeding each day? Yeah, that's a great question. And so, you know, I think that's where it comes back to, you know, things like bale grazing. Um, you can give cows three days of worth or three days worth of feed, knowing I'm going to have some waste, but I'm willing to accept that because my cost of labor and equipment or even windrow grazing is much less. And so sometimes that looking at the cost of equipment and labor versus the cost of the waste, sometimes I may be willing to accept more waste because the cost of going out and feeding and the labor associated with that is more expensive than the waste that I would have by giving the cows a couple's days worth of feed. Or it's also using things like um, temporary electric fence, where maybe I go out and put a bale, bale processors through, but I only give the cattle access to one day's worth. And then I have a gate that I can open and give them access to the next day or third day. There's, you know, it's just trying to be creative, thinking about how can I limit my labor and equipment use because those are expensive. Mm -hmm. And then how can I try to use some things that are not expensive to, you know, give cattle access to things at a different time. Uh, I think those are ways to think creative about the labor equipment situation. But as you said, that's a big deal, especially where you're at starting a tractor when it's 20 below mm -hmm. and going out, that's tough. And so could I find ways to put the feed out ahead of time, still limit waste, but uh, not have to have as much labor and equipment? Yeah. Fuel is expensive too, when we're talking about inputs and especially when it is colder, because it's not just starting the tractor and going about, you got to let the tractor warm up yeah. and everything that goes with it. And it's hard on equipment too. If yeah. Something's going to break. It's going to be when it's cold. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe yeah. That's just us, but that's sure what it feels like. <laughs> no, I mean, everything's cold. Steel's cold. Hydraulic fluid's cold. That's when things don't work like they're supposed to. Yeah. So, you know, we talked a lot about you know, you talked about systems. We talked about for when we do have to feed that harvested feed, you know, how to reduce waste there. How can producers look at being proactive to limit the amount of days that they are having to go out and feed from a grazing standpoint? What are some opportunities to look at there? Yeah, this, this is something I really enjoy talking about. I don't think we have enough time today. There's a <laughs> lot of different ways you can do things. So I think it's really, again, thinking about what do I have access to in terms of resources? Is there something I'm maybe not using right now that I could, or could I change my system? So, you know, I think, there, you know, the most, a lot of times the best thing to do from a cost standpoint is can I graze without anything between that cow's mouth and the grass, meaning there's no equipment there. You know, it's a perennial forage that's being grown without additional inputs of equipment, labor fertilizer. That's often the most inexpensive way. Now there's situations like where you're at, where you get covered up with snow and you can't do that. So then I think the next question is, is there something like windrow grazing or stockpiled uh, forage grazing that I can use? You know, there's some people to the North of Uche in Canada mm -hmm. that are uh, growing corn and grazing stockpiled corn through the winter. That's a totally different concept for most of us in the United States. We yeah. just don't even think about that. There's some really cool stuff from my perspective being done in Canada on, on grazing standing corn. And when you look at the cost of that versus the cost of, like you talked about, equipment, harvesting, delivery, it's pretty cool what they are able to do. Uh, even with like some summer fall calving cows, leaving calves on the cows through the winter, 
grazing stockpiled corn, you know, providing a little hay access with that. So, you know, I think all those things that are opportunities to find ways to try, try to reduce harvested feed costs still may be a harvested feed, but the way it's grown and the way it's delivered to the cattle is different. And so those are things I encourage people to think about. Awesome. Well, Aaron, as we kind of work towards wrapping up the conversation today, do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with the listeners out there? Yeah, I think I would just encourage people to really think strategically, think out of the box about their feeding system. And, you know, I think we get caught, I get caught in, well, what do we do last year? or What do we do the year before? And we think about what we've always done and we're comfortable with that. And I, I understand that. But most of the opportunities in your operation are probably way outside of your comfort zone. And I know that seems a little odd, but it's probably there may be some opportunities to really make changes. And uh, I heard a quote here recently said, if you want to make small changes, do different things. If you want to make big changes, see things differently. So I'd really encourage you to, if you're thinking about your system and you're not very excited about what your costs are and where things are at, just start throwing out crazy stuff about what can we do differently. It's going to be uncomfortable, but then say, okay, which of these are really maybe possibilities? Could we find someone who's doing this? Another producer, another operation. Let's go see what they're doing. When you actually go to someone's place, you talk to them, you see how it works. All of a sudden it starts to make it real. Maybe this is something we could do. And then try it on a small scale. You know, hey, we've been feeding for five months of the year, harvested feed. Could we try to figure out a way to shave a month off of that this year? What could that look like? How could we do that? And so you let's do that this year. Okay, how did that work? What went well? What didn't go well? What could we do? Uh, and so you just start taking some small bites to see what you could do with your feed cost. Those are things I'd really encourage. I think nobody that I talk to thinks labor, equipment, fuel, and harvested feed is going to get much less expensive. I mean, we'll see some market prices go down, but in reality, nobody I talk to says, boy, I think we're going to see $50 a ton hay again. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> At least not where I live. Uh, that's not going to happen. And so I think let's just talk about if we really think things are going to get more expensive from a harvested feed standpoint going forward, how can we get ahead of that a little bit and strategically think about that for our operation? All right. Well, Aaron, thank you for taking time out of your day to share your knowledge and experience and thoughts with the listeners out there. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my privilege. And, you know, my contact information is online. If people have questions or they want to talk about a system or looking at, you know, what's it cost me, be happy to visit with them, talk about their ration, talk about costs, look at strategies. Uh, that's, that's something I really enjoy doing and part of my role with Nebraska Extension. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.